Hi, I'm Anne Lamott, and I cannot believe I get to be on this show with Maria Menounis. And today we're going to talk about my new book, Dusk Night Dawn, um, and the themes of revival and courage and restoration after, after dark and scary times. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we do here every single day, or at least we try. And our quote of the day, hope begins in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come. You wait and watch and work. You don't give up. And that is from our guest today, Anne Lamott. I am coming to you from our West Coast studio, everybody. And I am so excited to be chatting with best-selling author Anne Lamott about her new book, Dusk, Night, Dawn, which Oprah Magazine named the most anticipated book of 2021. Also, aside from my husband in the East Coast studio, along with Kelsey and Steven, wherever the fuck he is, uh, we have <laughs> a very special guest co-host with us today, my Greek sister, you may remember her from our episode before Christmas. She's the co-founder of Impact Theory, host of Women of Impact that I was just recently a guest on. She's a badass, extraordinary entrepreneur, Lisa Bilio. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, girl, you know it's an absolute honor. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. We're going to have so much fun. All right. Well, we are going to move along to our guest today. Anne Lamott is an American novelist and nonfiction writer who's often referred to as the people's author. She's been a best-selling author for more than two decades. Anne's writing, marked with self-deprecating humor and openness, covers such subjects such as alcoholism, single motherhood, depression, and Christianity. Her genius lies not merely in her ability to create humor from darkness, as writers often do, Rather, her unique genius is her ability to do so while maintaining her faith and leaving readers and the world with hope. To Anne Lamott, books are medicine. She's been quoted as saying, never give up on intimate friendships or science or nature. They've always saved us and will again. And recently posted, we are Easter people living in a Good Friday world right now. Better Together and the Heal Squad welcomes you, Anne Lamott. I can't believe I get to be here with you today. Oh, thank yeah. you. Well, I'm the one who's honored. You are incredible. And I think, you know, um, hope is the probably the biggest thing we need in life in general, but now more than ever. Yeah, I absolutely g agree with you. I wrote the last book I wrote, whose title I can't think of right this second, uh, is on entirely on hope because everywhere I went um, to on book tours or to give lectures and talks, the people in the audience just felt defeated and deflated. And um, by the last few years, and and oh, the heartbreaking UN climate change reports that just took the wind out of our sails and and just also what happens at the dining room table you know people life gets a little lifey sometimes and and where do you even start to 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 get restored and to get your faith back in life so when I wrote Dust Night Dawn, I had all, Australia was on fire, remember? It seems so long ago, but it wasn't. And I thought, where do you even start? Well, you start where your butt is, you start where your feet are, you start where your breath is, because if you remember to breathe, then I think you're kind of umbilically connected to the divine or to, to the goodness or the love energy or whatever the bigger thing is um, outside of our own sort of pinball minds. I, I love that. And I love um, that quote that we just mentioned about um, being in, we are Easter people living in a good Friday world right now. Can you expand on that a little bit? I don't think it's original to me. I think it's probably been around for several hundred years. But um, the world, when my best friend's son just died, he was 23 and he'd been sick for a long time and yet she's a believer in um, that the soul is immortal and that we don't know what the future holds, but we really do know and trust who holds the future and thank God it's not us. Although I always think I'd be um, 
a really good West Coast representative for God. But, you know, I realize I'm in charge of helping the animals get fed because they don't have opposable thumbs. And I'm really not in charge of too much else. And the world is often um, in so much turmoil and darkness and um, fearful voices. And then for me, um, this endless data stream, you know, of stuff that doesn't bring me healing, hope, or peace of mind. It actually does the opposite. It's like, you know, it's overstimulating and it frightens me and it makes me feel like a little child again. So um, the Easter... The Easter morning is when uh, death has been abolished and death is no more and the sun is out and the grass, you know, the grass is, no. not only is the grass blooming, but these tiny green shoots have broken through the concrete. So Easter morning, and let's not even get started on all of the chocolate that people are foisting on us. So that to me is what heaven will be like. <laughs> <laughs> a really beautiful green um, lawn and a ton of chocolate. And of course, I, God. Yeah. I, by the way, and fun fact for everyone, chocolate was my first word in Greek, <gasps> uh, which has many syllables. So I think I might have been a prodigy and lost my way along the way. But um, it was it's socolata, and I have Socolata. it. On, I have it on tape. My mom recorded it. <laughs> Um, the chocolate and me are friends, but, uh, I, I, I wanted to talk about your first book for a split second because we share a connection in the brain cancer world. Your dad was diagnosed with brain cancer when you were, uh, I think 22, 23. Yeah. 23. and it was the impetus for your first book, which yeah. I found fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was 23. My dad had uh, metastasized melanoma in his brain, which at that time, this is the later 70s, um, no one had recovered from. And so I did what you, I'm sure you do, and I always do, is you try to find a book about somebody who has already been through it, who mm -hmm. can share their experience, strength, and hope, and say, this is helpful, don't even bother with that, it's a waste of time, and and, um, and try this, and uh, never give up, and, uh, and there weren't any books like that, because uh, cancer hadn't really come out of the closet yet. It was sort of considered unseemly <laughs> to mention cancer cancer um, or death. And my dad always had a, a pro prognosis that was never going to be good. And so um, as I later always told my writing students, write the book you'd love to come upon. Mm -hmm. And so I started, my dad, who is a writer, said, um, I'm going to tell my version of this because the stories are what heal us. You know, the great Barry Lopez said, sometimes we need a story more than we need food. And um, so my dad said, I'm going to tell my version of this. Why don't you tell yours? And I just started writing a slightly fictionalized version of what our family was going through, which is that it was like an atom. I'm sure it was the same for you when you had your diagnosis. It's like an atomic bomb has fallen on you briefly until you are restored to your center and to truth and to the bigger reality that you're safe. They're completely safe in God's good hands. And... Um, my family had a wonderful sense of humor, and I've always said at every talk I've ever given that uh, laughter is carbonated holiness. And even though we were an atheist family, um, I we had laughter, and we had family love, and we had meals, you know, and that's about as spiritual as life gets. So I started writing about both the hard stuff um, to offer other people that might read my book someday kind of a road map. That first we tried this and that. First you try to control something. You try to kind of horse this into submission, and it doesn't work that way. And so then you try something else. You try living from inside. You try to, to live inside your heart, the heart cave, where your higher power and your little scared little kids live. And then little by little you realize there are some people in your galaxy who are very very safe to tell the truth with and once you can say I believe in God and this sucks and I hate it and people go thank you for trusting me then you're halfway home so that was what my first book was and you know I think it's 43 years ago can that be right wow it was called hard laughter right it's called hard laughter yeah 
Yeah, I, I wonder when you look back on it, you know, so many people are dealing with, you know, life threatening diseases. What were the biggest lessons? I know you were saying, I think in, in a sense, we don't have a lot of control and to kind of surrender. Um, but yeah, what other what are the things do you have to offer for people who are dealing with this? Well, for me, I have two brothers and one is two years older than I am. And so to me, surrender <laughs> means you get your face ground in, in the dirt, you know, surrender in my family because we were left wing intellectuals. You, don't, you never surrender. And um, surrender means weakness. And mm-hmm. as I developed spiritually, as I evolved in my 20s and then converted in my early 30s and got sober at 32, you learn that surrender is, you know, you put down your weapons and you come over to the winning side, which is the side of goodness and gentleness and, and this trippy love energy that, or this love intelligence or whatever you would call God. Um, you might call God Phil. Whatever it is, it's not your own kind of no. screwy no. pinball machine mind. As soon as you come over to the winning side, um, that for me is is when you have a shot at peace of mind and acceptance. The surrender leads to the acceptance. It doesn't mean you have to love it. It's like forgiveness doesn't mean you have to have lunch with the person next week. It's that you accept that something really scary and bad is is happening or has happened over which you don't seem to have a lot of control and that you're powerless, but you're not helpless. And what I learned at the young age of 23, my dad died when I was 25, and he really was the center of our world. He really was our higher power. Um, was that it begins with this kind of radical self-love and this radical self-care. And we were raised in the American way. I don't know if it's the same in Greece, but the American way is that you believe that if you just get something that you think is missing, then you're going to be okay, you know, and that there's something that you can achieve, buy, (laughs) date, um, or discover that will fill the Swiss cheese holes in your soul. And the Swiss cheese holes are so big when either you or your most beloved person has a, a, a cancer diagnosis. But what you learn spiritually is that we're not hungry for, for more and more and more of what we think we need to get. We're, we're hungry for what we're not giving. And that once we start to give and we become people of service and we get out of ourselves to become people for others, paradoxically we begin to fill up again and uh, it's like the font inside of us the holy water font fills up and we're not running around desperately with our little begging cup trying to get more from the world you know the world did not give me love and peace of mind and the world can't take it from me but I need to remember that it's going to be by sharing what I've been so freely given by giving that I receive I just got the chills everywhere. Lisa, I'm sure you are too. Oh, God. (laughs) My neck was hurting so much. I was nodding so much at that. That was so powerful. It's just amazing to think of it in those terms. Like, we're hungry for what we're not giving. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Like when people call, which they do, um, people I love, and they're upset or they feel really empty or freaked out by something... Um, I say, you know what, if you want to have loving feelings, which is, let, to me, heaven, to be filled with loving feelings, right, Maria? Mm-hmm. It's heaven. Um, if you want to have loving feelings, you do loving things. And you do so, a few anonymously. You know, I'm a Sunday school teacher, and I have a tiny little Sunday school at a failing church with usually three kids of all different ages. And, um, and I have taught them this basic lesson. If you want to feel happy and filled up, let's go outside right now and give away half of the crayons at this. We have tons of crayons. Let's give away crayons to people on the street who have kids. Let's give them, cray- let's give them our pencil sharpeners and some colored pencils because it's hard for homeless people to get pencil sharpeners, right? So we start to give away what we have in our class that we've thought made us feel so rich and endowed. We give it away and we get ecstatic we actually get too happy right so and then if I taught them also 
during Advent one year that we would every single day, besides trying to give crayons and, pen sharpen and uh, pencils and pencil sharpeners to kids on the street, that we would flirt with really old people because the culture doesn't honor old people, right? They're yep. annoying. You're at Whole Foods and, and you're in the express line and they've got coupons, <laughs> right? <laughs> Please, God, don't ever let me be a person of coupon, <laughs> couponage. And so, and people, and they don't get noticed. And so I would say to my kids, as we prepare, as we do now for Easter, um, we flirt with old people. We say, you know what? I love your hat. Where'd you get it? Or you say, if you're on the street, is your dog friendly? Can I pet her? She's so pretty. And you just lift other people's spirits and the paradox, because all truth is paradox, is that you're the one that gets happy. <laughs> Oh, I love flirt with old people. Kelsey is uh, the voice of, of God here. Uh, she's uh, our producer. And she and I share that we love old people. Um, I always was the one that Me sat too. with the old people. Um, Me too. And Me too. <laughs> Me too. So mm -hmm. I, I like the concept that you're bringing to us to make us more aware of, of something we can do um, in a, in a kind of grander way, right? Like flirt with old people. I think it's so great. I think of all the people I was, go I went to the bank yesterday and, you know, there was like the janitors, that were, you know, and I have such a tight connection because we grew up janitors. So I always make sure I stop and acknowledge and say hello to them. And they're usually like a little confused. And, um, but I, I'm going to now really focus on, on flirting with old people. I usually will say hello, but now I'm going to, I'm going to take it a step further. I love that. Yeah, it's really insane how people don't um, admire um, older the older generation, if you will, more because it's like they're so freaking wise. How many people, yeah. Maria, turn to you and it's like, oh my god, Maria, you've achieved so much. Tell me, tell me, tell me your words of wisdom. And it's like we have an entire world of humans that have lived 70, 80 years of yeah. learning and failing. And it's like, pick those people's brains. Those people know stuff about life. They know the realities about life. And in, it's like almost like if you had a crystal ball, right? And you could be like, what can I see in the future? They're right there. Ask them. You know, it's if we just lean into it and I, yeah, that flirt with old people, I'm with yeah. you, Maria. Like it's so, it's, grabs your heart yeah and also another thing um in dusk night dawn that i wanted to kind of um focus not with you all necessarily i mean always i do but as a theme of this book was that if you don't have if you don't feel hope you don't you feel kind of a shaky hope let's say um that things have usually worked out and maybe they will again, who knows. Um, but that if you bring the hope to other people, then you're all of a sudden in a sort of gravity field of hope or a force field of hope. So that if you're the one that brings the hope, there's hope, you know, that you put it in your little bat, your Easter basket or your, you know, your, your, your backpack and you bring hope. Like we, we have a ministry at my church of um, a convalescent home and, um, and I went for 20 years, and I haven't been doing it lately. But um, you go there, and this is pre-COVID, but you just touch people in wheelchairs, and you touch their skin, and you say, I am so glad to see you. Because you know what? No one else is telling them that day, yeah. right? Because they're kind of inconvenient. And to be honest, people are often helping that they'll pass before they spend the whatever money they've saved up. And they're hoping they'll pass because it's extremely depressing. My mom had Alzheimer's. My dad died of brain cancer. And I know it's excruciating. And so if you touch someone or you look into their eyes and you say, oh, my God, I am so glad to see you. You brought hope. And all of a sudden, you're surrounded by the force field of hope. You know, it's so crazy because the American way is go get it, go find it and go achieve it. And, you know, you all know this. If the world told you if you achieved this or that, it would fill the Swiss cheese inside of you, right? As soon as you got this, as soon as you got on the air, as soon as you got your own show, as soon as you got published, as soon as you got on the New York Times bestseller, as, as soon as, as soon as, right? And you get there and it's great, very briefly. <laughs> very briefly, yes. Very briefly. Can I tell you a quick story, Maria? Yes. Yeah. Okay, my son, uh, Sam, who you read about, um, has this podcast called Hello Humans. And um, he didn't, and it's, it's about how to become more human and less of the 
uh, the robot or, you know, the, uh, I th- the greyhounds at the racing track who are racing after m- mechanical bunny rabbits who then they catch and then have caught, a, 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 you know, f- fake fur and a battery. Um, and he sort of does it. How do you human up? And he did an interview with the great composer Paul Williams, and who won an Academy Award for uh, the Barbara Str- yeah. Streisand movie. I think it was for The Way We Were, but I'm old and funny, and I got my second vaccine last night, and that's my excuse. <laughs> but anyway, I think for The Way We Were. And Paul was still drinking and using at the time, and he's clean and sober. My son's clean and sober, and I'm clean and sober. But he said the night he won the Academy Award, he stood before... A hundred million people, right, accepting the highest accolade you can achieve in his profession. And he said to Sam, it bought me 24 hours. And I have never forgotten that. It bought him 24 hours of good self-esteem, you know, because it's an inside job. It's not out there. And so that, that respect that you long for is not out there. It's from you and maybe your very, your two very best girlfriends, you know, the, and, and it's an inside job. It's a, it's a very tender green shoot, like that breaks through the concrete of all the lies that the world told you to get ahead in first grade, let alone college, let alone your job, you know, to scramble and scratch and claw until you are about to achieve the thing that you think will fill you up. And as Paul Williams said to Sam... It bought me 24 hours. So how do you navigate life when life we're taught is a series of goals? We need a dream. We need to have these kind of benchmarks, right? And, you know, your parents teach you, you want to go to college so you can get a job and you can be successful and success is measured with awards like Oscars or Nobel Peace Prizes or, you know, whatever it is in your field. How do you kind of grapple with that notion, but then also like the three of us have been on the other side. We've had those accolades, And so we've seen that it's fleeting and it's quick, but I can't tell that to somebody who hasn't achieved their dream yet, that there's still more and that there's still going to be a void after that, that that isn't it. How do you explain it to someone who hasn't gotten it? And then how do you explain what the real fulfillment is and how you get it? Well, for me as an artist, um, I have been dirt poor. I've done that one, and that was not as festive as I had hoped, but I got my first real advance for my fifth book, which was um, Operating Instructions, a journal of my son's first year. And then my second book was called, my my, uh, sixth book was called Bird by Bird, and I got something like 50,000 for it, but it's two years of living, and by then I had a a baby. And um, and so what, and I just dreamt, of being the next Stephen King or, you know, being on Oprah and having a swimming pool and buy, getting fish forks, you know, and <laughs> I always thought fish for, forks would mean you'd really arrive. And, um, but what I had to remember was that the work itself was where the payoff was and that you, you bring your very, very, very best ingredients to your work, that you try to come from a place that's not trying to con anybody. You're not trying to suck people into web. And I have to sell books in order to support my family. And I've been doing this for 45 years. And, and so, and it's wonderful to be a published writer and it's wonderful to have these big audiences. I love that, but they make me, um, I go into postpartum after every big event like I'm publishing next week and and I'll be postpartum afterwards I'll be exhausted I'll be kind of sad and um and 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 all that energy will have dissipated and people won't be clamoring for me ish not that they're quite clam but you're you kind of clamored for me and I scam my way onto your show which really was a dream come true and Mm -hmm. so um I don't ever I don't ever dismiss people's dreams my son has a tattoo on his arm that says we never give give up. And it took him a very, very long time to get clean and sober, which he did like nine years ago. And it took him a very, very long time to get a podcast, Hello Humans, that were, that was a culmination of everything he loves, which is um, 
sharing, disseminating spiritual wisdom to an audience of people that are starved for kind of operating instructions on how do we go on when we've lost somebody that's an unsurvivable loss? How do we go on when we've been sober about three weeks and we never quite remembered how to write checks, you know, or shower or floss? And or how do we go on when somebody we can't live without has ended the relationship or we can't seem to get the job that we know we would just nail? How do we go on? Well, we do. We stop. We, we get to that's all this kind of forward thinking and this tripping and it's fantasy and which I love. Don't get me wrong. But it's it's again in some ways like that mechanical rabbit that the greyhounds are chasing after. And so you 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 sit with the greyhound and you say you can race today or you don't have to race today. But I got us a breakfast sandwich at Mario's and um, and I'm going to give you half and let's just sit, let's just rest. Rest is just about the most spiritual act we do, and yet we signed a contract the first day of kindergarten. Well, no, not kindergarten, because you get to lie down and rest on, um, in kindergarten. But say first grade, you're going to keep going. You're going to be in forward thrust. You're going to nail it. They start you off on the multiplication tables, right? you got to memorize the multiplication tables, or, or we've got a problem on our hands. Then you've got to figure out division, and then long division. Oh, my God. And so the thing is that we have teachers. We had teachers um, in kindergarten. We have teachers now, like your husband and I, would both turn to the same books. If we were in in loss or just limbo or when life is, again, just too lifey, you turn to the teachers We've all, and you turn to rest. You turn to prayer. You turn to meditation. You, you find a guided meditation if you're just too crazy to sit there quietly for 10 minutes. You, um, and when we first get sober, the old timers always tell us hungry, angry, lonely, tired, which spells halt. And they say, what are, what's going on right now that you're tripping? I heard a preacher say once, I think this is in Dust Night Dawn, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not trip. But the old timers helping us get sober 35 years ago said to me, are you hungry? What's going on? Why are you tripping? Why are you thinking about beer when it brought you to your knees? So are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you exhausted? Are you tired? You're probably one of those things, so why don't we deal with that, and then then they'll be kind of trickle down. We take care of our soul and our heart through the external world, you know, through the skin, through the through eye contact. Like we're looking right into each other's eyes right now, Maria. Right, mm -hmm. and so it's like in Traveling Mercies, um, there's a piece about the shyness I feel about my jiggly cellulite thighs, and how. Um, I learned radical self-care for me to deal with the shame, this kind of institutional shame that women um, start learning at four years old was to rub lotion into my thighs, rub this delicious smelling coconut lotion into my thighs, and also to put a little temporary tattoo of a rose on my thighs and to beautify my thighs as a way of healing my, my hurting soul. And so... I have a lot of people that come to me wanting to know how to write or if they should give up or if it's ridiculous to keep trying. And I say, it would be ridiculous to quit. You know, I always tell people, no one in your family is going to be happy to hear that you're writing a memoir. But I am. And if you, you know, if people wanted to write more kindly about you or more warmly about you they should have behaved better and I tell my writing students you own everything that happened to you and mm -hmm. just tell it to me just tell it to me but on paper so it's it's I'm sure what you tell people who want to you know break into the world of of acting and broadcasting and 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 sharing at this level that you've discovered you know that or that I mean I just think God is such a show off but there was a shape waiting for you and all this other teaching and healing and work prepared you for it and at some point kind of scared I mean we do it scared you mm -hmm. push back your sleeves and you take a long breath and you go and you step into the shape that's waiting for you so that's I, I, I'm sorry to be so long-winded but I hope that answers 
telling people to prepare to step into that shape mm -hmm. because it's waiting for you and you get ready and you take a kind of quavery breath and then you you step there used to be this thing when I also first got sober it's a little poem the old timers handed us and it said when you've come to the end of all the light you know and you're about to step into the darkness of the own unknown one of two things will happen you'll either land on solid ground or you'll be taught how to fly I love that yeah it's like it's it's just it's all a big journey and it's how I feel like it's like how we just choose to go through it mm -hmm. so for me like when I was diagnosed with my brain tumor it was just a few months after my mom was diagnosed with her brain tumor so we had two atomic bombs mm -hmm. and I chose in that moment that I was going to go through it with laughter my best friend still hates me for it because I would crack jokes left and right about Debbie, the stupid tumor in my head, I called her <laughs> Debbie. And she's like, this was not funny because she was so emotional about it. And I was like cracking jokes and singing like tunes on the way to the hospital for surgery. But I really do believe it's how we choose to go through this life. And even when, you know, you talk about how, how kind of difficult the world is right now and challenging and scary and you know, I am making conscious choices to shut off all that noise for my mm -hmm. own sanity and my own well-being. And I think that's a choice. And you talking about, um, you know, being hungry for what we aren't giving, that's really just a call to service, right? Is like, go serve people and you'll feel better, which we all know. Um, I'm always advising people when they've lost their way. I'm like, go volunteer. You're going to feel so much better. It's going to be for you, not for them. Go volunteer and you'll find your way through that. Um, I just think it's all just choices. It's decisions. Yeah. It's decisions to, uh, to take to rise up and to take the higher road and to um, to remember that for me and obviously for you since your show is called Better Together that the nourish the nutrition and the healing comes from the precious community like the great um, well Martin Luther King talked about the beloved community uh, where he got his strength you know and that that is where we experience the power and the peace of God as we understand God but that Henry Nouwen who was a Jesuit um, from France became very 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 famous Harvard lecturer bestseller and he left it all to go to this community of people with severe disability learning disabilities and for 20 years he helped a man every day dress eat learn who never could say a word back to him and to talk think about the precious community and oh my god thank you god thank you thank you thank you that i do i have this tiny little church i have a recovery community i have the greater community of all of us who's are um sharing what we're finding as we go about healing and about god consciousness and about you know, and it's so exciting. You know what I always think of, too, Maria, is the cellist in Sarajevo, that famous poster from 20 years ago after Bosnia-Herzegovina was bombed to the, you know, to the Stone Ages, and he put on his tuxedo every day. He'd been in the uh, uh, um, Bosnian orchestra, and he put on his tuxedo, and he took his cello down to the bombed outside of where the, I think, where the symphony hall had been. There was just rubble, and he played Mozart and Brahms every day, and people came, and they were healed. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was hungry for what for giving. was given to, and yeah. so he went out and he gave, but he was giving to himself. I mean, how do you kind of... Um, explain hope for people like how do you help people find hope who are hopeless oh that's it oh i i think this um everything i've the last few books have all been about hope because these have been such dark and hopeless times for the last five years or so and um or more than that and i think this is my third book in those five or six years where one was on mercy one was on hope but they're the same thing um, mercy is hope to feel mercy merciful towards someone is to feel hope again instead of that cold 
shut, you know, when your heart's shut down, it's hard to feel any kind of hope at all. But we don't heal our minds with, you know, our, our um, judgmental, raggedy, materialistic, graspy minds with our materialistic, graspy minds. We do what we started out talking about. We surrender. We say to God, now I have a very bitter prayer. You know, I wrote a book called Help, Thanks, Wow, the Three Essential Prayers. But I think if I wrote uh, another book, it would be on the fourth prayer, and that would be whatever, or as the teenagers say, whatever. <laughs> And so when I surrender and I say to God, when I'm done, I say, whatever, here, fine. It's kind of bitter. I say, here, fine. And um, and then I have certain tools in my toolbox. You know, one of them is something I heard from my pastor years ago who gave a sermon on how you can trap bees in a mason jar without lit, a lid on. Um, if you put a tiny drop of honey in the bottom of the mason jar, because they just sort of walk around trying to find more honey and, and feeling upset and bitter as they bump into the glass walls of the jar, when all they have to do is look up, right? There's no lid on the jar. They look up, and they're free. They can fly. And so I always think about, look up, look up. If I get outside, I'm 80% better. You don't look, you don't stand outside and go, well, this is kind of a medium full moon tonight, you know? You walk outside and you go, wow. Mm -hmm. So um, it's all sort of of a piece that uh, I heard a great acronym somewhere. I forgot where. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of, for fear, because m most of my problems are mental and they're mostly that I get into fear and old childhood fears, you know, that I'm not good enough that I'm a fraud, that I'm about to be busted, that something will happen to Still? my son. Pardon? Still? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a book out in a week, and I'm just dreading that the reviews and people say, oh, boy, here, here she's back on hope again. Talk about beating a dead horse. But um, even when Oprah says it's the most anticipated book of 2021, you still feel like that? It's Paul Williams saying that getting the Academy Award bought him 24 hours. Wow. But um, but anyway, so I get into fear, you know, and uh, it's, an, it's part of the human condition. And what the acronyms people love is like forgetting everything's all right or... Um, but the one I love is the frantic effort to appear recovered. And what that means to me is that if I have to, if if I have a frantic effort to have, to can try to convince everyone that I'm doing really well, I'm boy, I'm just having a fabulous self-esteem today. Oh, the world is my oyster. Oh, I've got a, you know it's my 19th book coming out, and Oprah likes me, and blah blah. blah and then, then I'm doomed. But if I say to my husband, or or even to my grandchild, or even to the the kitty. I feel scared. I just feel really uptight and worried today. And I got one bad review already. I got it. Oh, my God. I mean, you're going to get bad reviews, right? You get you must get really bad feedback. And I don't ever think, well, this person's just an idiot. This person's a jerk. I think they alone can see <laughs> through me. So, um, but the frantic effort to appear recovered, fear, means that if I will just share that I feel like I'm about eight and I'm knock-kneed. I was a really emaciated child. I was just teeny tiny being. And I feel scared and alone and all that. Then people go, thank you. Oh, I'm so happy you told me. Then they say, how can I serve you? And I have, my mother was from um, Liverpool. So, of course, the first line of defense is a lovely cup of tea, Lisa. I'm sure you're familiar with that. <laughs> of course. Tea is chemotherapy. <laughs> can spirit. I... And how did you not let that hold you back then? Because just like Maria, right? It's like, come on, Oprah says that they're excited about your book. But I hear what you're saying. It doesn't matter what other people say. It's really how you feel. So if you're feeling scared, um, you've got all this negativity coming, you know, who am I to write another book, etc. You still did it. And I think most people get frozen at the point of the fear and they don't keep going. So how did you keep going even though you still have it even today? Well, the thing that I love about getting older, besides Medicare <laughs> um, and Social Security and the very <laughs> young people at the 800 numbers who just are so happy I've called and they want to help me, 
Um, what I love is that you get rid of so much stuff over the years that, you know, at about, I think, early 40s for me, I started to realize how much stuff I was still carrying that didn't serve me anymore. And that really kept the, my plane, my spiritual plane, flying way too low. And I started being willing to let go of it. And it's hard. I love my stuff. You know, everything we let go of has claw marks on it. But it's like all those papers I kept or your books. You know what? This is funny. When I was uh, uh, 50, I called the San Francisco Public Library and I said, can you send one of the friends of the library over Saturday? And I gave them 400 books. And they were books that I'd been carrying around since college um, because I thought um, everybody would see that I had read them and that I, I'm a college dropout and that people would think I'm much smarter and educated than I really am. And I thought somebody's going to read this book and it's going to blow their mind. It's going to change their life. And it, for me, it's just about making people think um, what I wish they thought about me or hope they continue to think about me or whatever. So it's really so much of the lightning. I've, I've actually gone to Cliff's with a backpack with rocks in it. And I have visualized these rocks, our um, ideas about myself, fears about myself, people I couldn't forgive, people I was still scared to forgive. Who would I be if I didn't still resent that person? You know, this person, it, resenting this person is kind of um, part of my identity, whatever. And I just threw it off and I said to God, here, here, here. And um, and it li you really will love your 50s. You're both a lot younger than I am, but there's this lightning. So the fear comes in. It floats in like a goldfish into my head sometimes, but so do creative ideas, and so does this radical self-love. And with that comes the idea to practice today radical self-care. I put on a sweater that I really love, that I feel really pretty in, and it actually goes with the book. I just, I'm not trying to, and I got my nails done the other day. I love them, by the way. My veils, because I want to show you this. You'll love this. The, the sweater, the veil, the book cover, and the nails, right? And somebody might think that's so silly. That really changed your self-esteem. Yeah, because I feel really pretty. You know, and these hands are, I go into a manicurist and it's like the hands of a Czechoslovakian dock worker, you know, and I, <laughs> and I leave there and I'm Beyonce, yeah. right? So I'm, Right. So um, that's what I know. And that's what is when things are hard. I go get a manicure. I go get a salad that is really kind of expensive. It's kind of a rip off. It's $13, but it's got quinoa and roasted butternut squash in it. And it's actually like $18. I don't want people to think I'm a materialist. I go I because I would do it for you. I've never seen you and I've never seen your crew. And if they were sad, I would say to them, do you want to walk into town? It's 10 minutes because there's this salad that they're selling that is medicine. And um, and then you, you might take a chance on me and go, really? Because, you know, another thing, here's the great William Blake, who I know you're familiar with, a great spiritual poet said, we're here to learn to endure the beams of love. And if you were raised in a family like me, you, I learned to be the giver of the beams of love. I was like, I was raised to be a little flight attendant to the family and then the greater world. I know how to mix drinks at seven, you know? And I, I was like uh, the, those, little, those old cigarette girls from the 40s, you know, drinks and gum and snacks. Um, and, uh, and, to, and when I read Blake, we are here to learn, to endure the beams of love everything kind of fell into place for me. So if I go out, now manicures are 20 bucks now because of COVID and they have to give you the shields and everything. And the salad is 18 now. If I go there and I endure the love, the manicures, it's like the laying on of hands, right? Mm -hmm. And then they, I mean, it's, it's religious. It's like, you might as well be at the Vatican. And then you go get the salad, they're feeding you. They're feeding you. You know, they're feeding you love when they feed you nourishment and nutrition and when you receive it because today you deserve it. And that's my message to people. Today you deserve it. You deserve only love and nourishment. And sometimes the nourishment is, you know, roasted butternut squash and sometimes the nourishment is a pack of M&Ms. But, you know, you know what, what you're longing for, what the little kid inside of you really, really wants today. 
Yeah, I love that. I I will put on red lipstick when I'm not feeling oh, yeah. well and just kind of pops me up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I think we need our toolkit. You know, Lisa, yeah. I'm sure you have a toolkit too when you're having down days. What do you do? Yeah, it's absolutely. Um, so if you can see in my background, I have superheroes. I have, you know, women doing badass poses that make me um, not get so in my own head of emotion to kind of pull myself out. Um and then I have like kids books that are just so empowering from a mindset perspective, you know, like you can do anything, you know, when we were kids, it's like, we allowed ourselves to dream. We allowed ourselves to just be super creative and imagine and play dress up. And that gives you a certain emotion. That's why you see kids running around like they're actually superheroes. They're jumping off sofas because they're embodying it, but we don't allow ourselves to dress a certain way to allow ourselves to embody. And so I just go back to that childhood feeling, right? Same with you, the nails, it's the hair. The reason why I have braids is because it gives me a certain feeling. The reason why I wear a Wonder Woman necklace is because it gives me a certain feeling. So all of these things, I think it is completely, um, it's a 360, it's what music do you listen to how do you dress what do you surround yourself with what people do you surround yourself with what conversations you having every day it's every single little thing you do from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed that I think really um, allows your mind to take shape and now the question you ask is what shape do you want it to take Mm -hmm. that's a great answer Um, In my toolbox is one thing I love, which is something from the 30s. There was a priest who was not an alcoholic who helped Bill Wilson with the spiritual um, um, creation of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the priest said to Bill Wilson, sometimes I think that heaven is just a new pair of glasses. (laughs) And for me, that is so because, you you know, what you were saying, Lisa, is so true. But all day you're you're trying to bring yourself back to self-love and self-respect and empowerment and it keep the world keeps getting its grubby fingers on you and so you just keep starting over again like with meditation exactly but when I realize I have my bad glasses on like I'm trying to figure out what the world can give me today or when I'm looking at what a mess everything is or when I'm looking at the climate or I'm looking at the whatever and I'm and I've got the bad glasses on a fear or a judgment for me that's sort of one of my character defects um then I put the better pair of glasses on and I look out. Uh, it, it's like that belief that it's not what you're looking at, it's what you're looking with, you know. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking at with eyes of love and compassion and understanding that it's really hard for everyone sometimes, no matter, you know, you don't compare your insides to other people's outsides because everybody's trying to get their outsides to look just right and to look really enviable because of this English thing. I mean, no offense to your people, but my mother was from Liverpool and the whole thing was that no matter what's going on, you try to, you look good and you work on the persona so that the outside world thinks that you're an enviable family, right? And so that was one of the things I needed to heal of was that obsession with trying to get the outside to convince people that I was doing so beautifully. So how can you get the fresh air and the, and the glass of water, of cool mountain water, if you're pretending you don't need it? Yes. Oh, my God. That's so, so huge. Because I know for me, and Lisa, you probably have similar experiences being first generation Greek, but, um, you know, my parents drilled into me like, what are the people going to say? What are the people? Yeah. Yeah. We had to live our lives so that everyone knew that, you know, I was a good girl and I, you know, everything was perfect. And you talk about perfectionism as being the most toxic condition for the soul in your book. Um, Expand on that a little bit. Maria, what what you had actually said, though, I've heard you say about the story where you wrote the letter to your dad, based on what Anne was saying, right, is that we have these um, pressures from the outside world, the family, right? It's like, oh, you've got to be the kid that goes to college. I can't have the kid that doesn't go to college. Um, But you know, if you don't mind sharing that story of the letter that you wrote to your dad, where you had to embrace the fact that um, he may not have bragging rights anymore. Yeah, I don't know why I just got super emotional. But um, I had written letters before I had surgery to everybody, my parents and my husband. And I gave them to my best friend. And I said, when I'm under, give it to them. And the letter to my dad was the most important 
for me because I just, I wanted him to know that if I came out the other side, I was going to live a completely different life. I said, you might not have things to brag about anymore because I'm not going to be pursuing those things the way I have for significance. I'm going to pursue what my heart wants and that just might be a different course. And so, yeah, I think that was like a big kind of moment for me where I kind of just drew the line and said, I hope you still, which is crazy to think they're not going to love you, but that's your biggest fear. I said, I hope you'll still love me for who I am. And, you know, he's never asked me what I'm doing career wise ever again. Uh (laughs) He's just, are you okay? Are you healthy? That's all he cares about. It's a huge thing for anyone hearing it because it breaks the trance for other people. See, I mean, our stories our medicine for other people, like that story, like Rumi said, through love, all pain will turn to medicine, through love. So for you to tell that story of a father's love for his daughter and a daughter's love for her father, the trust implicit in you telling him that, like I might not be your your braggable girl, that we don't know, you know, um, is medicine because somebody else somebody else might just do that they might do that upon hearing you having told that they might write to your mom and say to their mom and say you know my whole life I've tried to do this and I I I I love you but I'm not going to do that anymore I'm not going to be able to pursue that I'm I'm um I'm beginning a new life of breaking through the perfectionism and I'm not going to be anything like the perfect flight attendant to this family that I've always been I'm going to be me and I love your idea for a book Maria because it's re-raising you yourself and it's um You know, it's about developing that awareness that you're doing this old, it's like this old jukebox, you know, from when we're 10 years old. And and, and those songs served us. We got ahead. We, you know, we're safe. We're loved. We're we're doing well. But they also were kind of crippling or pretzelizing. You know, they kept us really, really small. And so it's kind of, for me, about programming new songs onto the jukebox. And there's in Bird by Bird, the, the book on writing, um, there's a whole chapter on perfectionism because I so believe it's the voice of the oppressor. And more than anything else on the jukebox, it keeps me small and cringy and kind of desperate. And and so with my writing students, um, I just I talked about writing terrible first drafts. And I promise them that anything they've ever read, any book, any novel, any memoir, any anything they've ever read that they love, that changed their life began as a god-awful first draft. And that's how it comes through us. And if you're trying to do it well, you're not going to finish your book. I can tell you that, Maria. If, uh, Maria, if you're trying to write a beautiful book that's just exquisitely articulate and profound, it's not going to happen. But mm-hmm. if I say to you, in one year, I'd like you to have finished an uh, horrible first draft that's way, way too long and um, and that has way too much um, efforts at being humorous about like your, your best friend hated, but I mean, you're naturally going to be really funny, but, but I try to be funny sometimes. So people won't notice that I'm also a person who just aches with grief for the whole world and for my family, my brothers, my child, for my best friend whose son died. And so if I tell you, just do it, do it scared. And in a year, give me a very bad, first draft and then you and I can push back our sleeves and get serious and then when you write a second draft there's no way to a good second draft but through a really bad first draft and you have to trust me that the perfectionism is the voice of the oppressor there's a chapter in um Death Night Dawn I don't think I said this yet Um, where it says dread was my governess growing up and the dread that my parents and and the culture instilled in me kept me from running out into the street swimming in water that I might not have the skill to to survive Um, it kept me um, in high achievement but I don't need the dread anymore I need the faith I need the surrender I need precious community. I need the better pair of glasses. I need the uh, contract with myself to keep practicing the awareness that I'm playing those old songs again and they don't serve me anymore. So um, I would love to offer you that, that if you'd like to send me a really bad book in here, I I would receive it gladly. 
Oh my goodness. Well, I, um, I'm definitely going to take you up on that. I'm honored. Um, Good. it's incredible. Good. Um, guys, I'm going to let you jump in. I mean, we're covering so much ground and I want to make sure I let you guys ask, um, ask anything that you guys want to follow up on. Kevin, you included. Uh, my hand. And Kelsey, Kelsey too, the voice of the show. Mm. <laughs> I mean, my hand's tired from taking notes. I know. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I'm processing everything. And um, it's more comment than question. I, you know, even Lisa, when you speak to same thing and Maria, I always learn. But um, and uh, it just wow. What a reminder. Um, yeah, to just re look at uh, everything, our goals and what we think our purpose is and the pressure we put on ourselves and just kind of, you know, go back to just giving and doing. You know, it's like what it seems like it's about and being decent mm. and, and just being. leave it at that. And being, and being yeah, right. And being, yeah. being, oh my God. Yeah, being, you're right. You're right. Because yeah. I'm still in that like um, always do, do, do. So yeah, yeah. Do, doing, That's giving, fun. being. That's how I end the show every day. And I say, be a nice person, make good choices and be present. Yeah. Because I think it kind of just boils down to that. I will jump in since... Um, you know, Kevin's just kind of taken aback by everything. And I'll say, I really love the fact, um, and Lisa, I know you pointed this out too, so you can jump in as well, that you just had your first marriage. Yeah. Two years ago. Two yeah. years ago <laughs> in your sixties. Mm -hmm. And I think that that provides, I mean, just all you do is give hope, but that's like a whole other level of hope. And I, I was saying this morning that I wanted to make sure we didn't forget to touch on that because a lot of pressure, again, is placed on, well, you have to get married by a certain age and you have to have kids and all these things. And Lisa, I know you and your husband had made a decision not to have children. We were kind of floundering and now I've moved forward with, you know, going, going for it. Um, and then I just will surrender to whatever God decides for us and we'll see what happens. But you know, for, for someone to, to find their first marriage, um, in, in a, a different age group than we're used to, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. And, and, you know, what was it like before and what's it like now? Well, let's see, I, um, got married three days after I got Medicare and social security at 65. And the funny thing is I'm a year younger than my husband, Neil, and um, but I'm a year and three months. So he was the day we got married. He was two years younger because he wasn't going to turn six, one year younger for um, three months. But um, he I met him through match. I wrote about this in one of one book or another. I can't remember what. But um, he uh, is like. He's like having a best girlfriend, but that I, I get to sleep with and have a life with. And um, it's like a best girlfriend. And the first day we met on Match, you know, it goes back to my belief that we have a dual citizenship here, that we're children of the Most High, we're children of the Divine, and we're these kind of <laughs> neurotic, um, slightly damaged, um, set in our ways, um, people with a human biography. And so when I met him for coffee, um, I'd set everything up so I could leave immediately if it didn't go well, because I'd been on match. I mean, I had I had one guy on match bring me a book proposal on our first date that he hoped I could help him with. Ugh. And I had another guy with a Beavis and Butthead laugh. You know, I'd had a lot of dates. And there was this guy, and he was brilliant and funny and sensitive and good looking. He had these beautiful, he's very tall, he had these beautiful sort of doctor's hands. And um, and so I didn't have to get rid of him after an hour. In fact, the, <laughs> I would call the Holy Spirit nudge, that, but you could call it anything. It's like you get a tug on your sleeves, like, like maybe go, maybe maybe stay with this a little longer. And so I said, I had to, to pick up a cabinet from uh, Craigslist for my grants. And I said, I have to drive over to other town half I said do you want to go I have to do errands and he goes errands I love to do errands 
that's what I meant. And so we got in the car and we had two more hours together driving to pick up this Craigslist. And, and we had never been apart for a single day unless I've been on book tour or something. And so um, that was like I was talking about with you earlier, that there's a shape that waits for us and that these things in life that seem to be setbacks or things that we can really never break free. It's things on the jukebox that say you're stuck with this. This is the way it is. It'll never happen for you. You'll never publish. You'll never marry or whatever. I got the tug and I stayed with it. And and I stepped into this shape of, of, of receiving the beams of love. There are hardships, you know, and it's weird. I am set in my ways. I'm be 67 in a couple of months. And, um, you know, and I adore him. And I... I uh, I just think God is such a show off to have found somebody that I love to be with so much. And, you know, and we've been in quarantine for a year. Uh, year. And so sometimes I'll hear I'll hear the sound of him eating bacon and I'll think I can't do this for one more day. And it's so it's such a rip off that Protestants can't have annulments, you know, and maybe I'll convert. And um, because I have the dual citizenship, you know, I ha- our heart, my heart is joined with him in holy matrimony and in daily living. And, um, and so the hope was that with enough love from my precious community and enough healing and, you know, in these beautiful tools in my battered old toolbox of presence just what you say every day at the close, just those things, that pr- presence and, 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 and kind of reawakening uh, 20 times a day to the, to the now, to the here, the now. I mean, that's why they call it the present, right? Um, is, is going to be enough for us to work through any hardship that will inevitably arise. It's like when I help young women or any age women get sober, I say to them, I can promise you hardship. I can promise you an unsurvivable loss because that comes with life. And that's just part of of our reality. But I can promise you also that you'll never have to go through it alone. I can promise you that you, if you choose, you don't have to drink or use again. You don't have to binge or, or be bulimic again. You don't have to one day at a time Keep destroying yourself, and I can promise you, we will always be there with you on the path. And um, and that's a lot for somebody to hear. Mm-hmm. You never have to do it alone. And it's a come as you are party. And no matter what you've done, we've probably done it too. And no matter what you think, we probably I may have thought it this morning, you know. And then I prayed about it. I asked God to to lift it from, you know, and thank God our minds don't have PA systems. (laughs) Yeah. Because otherwise I would not be on this show with you. And Kevin would not feel the way he does about me. He'd go, yo, (laughs) yuck. But anyway, um, and so there are promises we make to one another, you and I at a public level, and other people in their precious community and at the dining room table that we say, I know how scared you are. And I know that you don't have any hope right now, but I'm going to get you a cup of tea and I'm just going to listen. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go walk into town and get this really expensive salad. (laughs) And and I'm buying. Um, And, and you know, and that's that's a lot. I have a question about the, you know, I love the analogy of being the flight attendant in your family growing up. I was looking at Kelsey. I feel like she's the flight attendant in her family. I think Maria was in her family. I was in mine as well. I think there's a lot of people who do that. What's your advice to though, where that does get dysfunctional or unhealthy for the flight attendant? You know, in your case, you seem like you have a family of, with addictive behavior and you were serving them alcohol. So how do you reconcile in your life, being a flight attendant, but doing it in a healthy way that doesn't hurt you or other people? Well, for me, Kevin, and um, I grew up around um, parents that were really unhappy, hated each, really didn't like each other at all. But, the, you know, a marriage can be kind of a, a business of, of raising the children at some point. And I was a very shy, very, very anxious child. And um, 
very, very sensitive, which in the 50s was not something you, re- you want in a child. There was a book called The Overly Sensitive Child that all the parents read, and it was basically kind of a how-to book for parents who were saddled with such a sensitive child. No one said this is the best way to be, to be really permeable, to have, have your heart be really open. I was just scared, sad. I mean, I was funny. I was just like I am now today with you. I really was, but I weighed like 20 pounds. But I had migraines at five years old. I felt so much pressure. I was brighter than I was supposed to be. And I had this open heart. I couldn't go to the pound with when my family went to pick out new cats and dogs because I was smart. I was aware. And I knew that most of the animals didn't get homes. I was, I could see the cover of National Geographic. I could see what children in India had to live through. I could see the flies on the, on the, on each child, you know? And so my response to that in the fear of, of feeling that way was to be available to try to save and fix and rescue everyone in the family. And so I got this clipboard with my caseload on it. I had a baby brother at five when I was five and I needed to raise him because my parents probably should have raised orchids or, or toy co- or, uh, you know, teacup poodles or something. And it said they had three kids and they didn't, they didn't have great, they didn't have any self-esteem and they didn't love each other. And, and, uh, the family looked great on the outside. We're fabulous family. My parents are both gorgeous, fabulous people. And, um, and so what I did as a means of controlling things was to think that I was the reason my family wasn't happier, that there must be something I needed too much. I had these, I got a lot of migraines I skipped a grade. I was, you know, I became the identified patient in the family and the therapist and the priest and the cigarette girl because I got this addiction to people pleasing. And I felt I could deal with all these scary feelings if I just helped everybody else feel better about their lives. So my father had terrible relationships with women and he was not faithful and he drank too much and my mom was a black belt codependent and very very heavy and had an eating disorder and what I did was to try to save and fix and help them because my child's understanding was that then there would be trickle down and if I didn't need as much if I were less um just kind of important yeah that the the Lamotte family the boat would go the boat would sink, and so I learned my comfort zone became this pattern of saving and rescuing, and and also believing that I was the problem because if I'm the problem that's the only hope that a six year old child has of having any control in the family right if you're the problem you can do better and need less, but also so that and that you give what you wish you would be given. Correct. So you wanted someone to take care of you. Correct. And what you ended up doing is you took care of others. And I think that's something that we all have to kind of realize is um, you're giving what you really want in life. And you what wish you long would for. Be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So at some point, you start to get really great therapy, if you're lucky. And you start to get you have friends to whom you can tell anything you have soulmates you have partners you have pet pets and mm-hmm. little by little i become aware when i'm trying to like it's my addiction is the people pleasing and uh, if left to my own devices my child is 31 now right and he's launched um, and he's, um, but because of this sickness from childhood, I secretly would like to run alongside him on his hero's journey with like juice boxes and sunscreen, you know, and that would d- destroy him. My help is really not helpful. And at some point, probably 35 years ago, around the time I got sober, I realized that my help is not helpful, that it hurts people. And so I have to be aware of when I'm doing what I used to do for the family of being the flight attendant and release, release my husband, release my son, release my grandchild, release my best friend. And it doesn't mean I'm not there for them. It's not that I won't give them anything at all that is healthy for me to give them, but it has to begin with doing this 
radical, gentle, tender self-care with me? Am I hungry, angry, lonely, tired? Am I sad? Do I need to cry? I probably, if I'm trying to fix and save you, probably need to just lie down and really, really cry because I feel sad. The world can be such a sad place. And um, so... Wow. I still fall into it. You know, I fall into that thinking over and over again that I should be, you know, I should be doing for somebody, which probably God hopes they will do for themselves because then God will step in too. But um, if I'm feeling those feelings, it means that I'm in my disease of codependence and the healing is within. It's through prayer. It's through taking care of that scared little child who had a clipboard and migraines. And it's saying to her, are you so, let's go lie down with the kitty and have a little cry. And then let's go to Target and let's buy a new nail polish and let's buy some overpriced lip gloss, you know? And um, so it's a process, you know, it's, it's one day at a time. I'll just, I think we're probably about to run out of time horribly, but I don't know if we are. But there's an equation I have that helps me a lot. I love equations, I call it. But um, this, equa- this, this is a, um, the three A's. The first thing is awareness. And, and Lisa talked about this a lot too. You just become aware that you're doing this thing where you're not feeling like a superhero. You're feeling cringy and small and the exact opposite that you need you need to get any strength at all or any life force from out the outside of you right you get that awareness now i will often have a very a big red rubber band around my wrist and i'll snap it very very gently because it's how they help people quit smoking (laughs) because when you have a craving and you'll see if if you have contractions the contractions and the craving tell you the only way out is to use or to stop or to smoke or to whatever. And, and yet the contraction and the craving lasts a few minutes. And then you're closer to giving birth to the new life, to what your whole book, Maria, would be about. And so I snap, the, I snap this red rubber band and I breathe. I go, oh, right, because it snaps it's on my tender heart part of my wrist. And it's like being spritzed by a plant mister. It brings me back to the here and now which again is why they call it the present. The second A is the acceptance. Of course I'm doing it again. I'm, um, I'm trying to fix and rescue. I'm thinking scary thoughts or bad thoughts about my thighs or my, my personality or whatever, because that was my comfort zone as a child. If I was the problem, then I had some control. I could do better. I, could go, I forgot to go to the gym after I had a child 31 years ago. I certainly mean to start. Um, mm-hmm. I accept it. I, I mean, I have dual citizenship. You know, we, 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 I was raised to have bad thoughts about my body. I'm a girl. I was, a, my friend Pat used to say, if you're a girl, an American girl over 12 years old and you're not angry, you've missed the boat. Right. So, and then the, so I accept it. I'm healing. It's not going quite as quickly as I had hoped, but God, I've come a million miles. And the third thing is the action. And the action is the reset button. The action is you go outside and you look up. I always have my Sunday school kids do nature walks with me. And we look everywhere, everywhere with those good pair of glasses on for proof of God. Right now, we're starting to get little buds on the trees in Northern California. We're starting to get a little bit of grass, you know, and, um, and we look everywhere for signs of God, and we do, and we we get out our, our little packets of colored pencils um, and our pencil, and we give things away, and we give homeless people a bottle of water and a buck. You want to get really happy today? You want to have loving feelings? Do loving things without judgment. You give every homeless guy you see a bottle of water and a buck, and you say, "I'm glad to see you. You take care." And so. Um, that's the reset for me are the three A's, you know, and, and I have to do it. I maybe have to do it off and on all day. It's not like there, God has a magic wand and taps us on the forehead and we're stored to perfect uh, <laughs> spiritual uh, perfection. But we just keep going, oh, right. Oh, right. I just made that story up. I don't have to believe it or act on it, you know. I think I'll just sit down and have a cup of tea and then play with a kitty. What a great button to end this on I, I want to play with my Maximus my shepherd I want to just sit in my house the rest of the day 
And I think that's um, a really great lesson too, is, you know, I, I know I fill my time with my superhero cape on. And <laughs> I think I have to remember as well that I need to do it for myself. And I think a lot of us, especially women need to remember that. So, and thank you so much for all the wisdom, um, an incredible conversation. And the book is called Dusk Night Dawn on Revival and Courage. It is out March 2nd, which is just this uh, coming week. You can visit her website, which we're going to link in the description for her virtual book tour. And you can follow her on Instagram at Anne Lamott as well. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. And thank you all, Kevin and Lisa and the person that was the voice of God. <laughs> You're <Okay>. welcome. <laughs> all right, guys, that was an amazing conversation. Lisa, thank you so much. Oh, my for- pleasure partaking in it. If you guys haven't joined us over on uh, Patreon, you can click the link tree on my Instagram at Maria Menunos or on Better Together with Maria and join us for as little as $5. You get ad-free shows, but at the $10 a month, uh, you get our healing workshops as well, which gives you intimate access to our incredible Yes. And we have a whole library of them that you guys get to uh, enjoy as well as the ad free shows and the extra shows. And in case you missed our episode with Lisa and her husband, Tom, it was a great episode. It's episode number 184, where we talk all about success. And we'll link to that in the uh, summary of this episode. In the meantime, follow and by us the way, better to get- just to preface Maria, Lisa and Tom are a power couple self-made oh, if yeah. you're familiar with quest bars th- th- it's them and they started it from scratch and so now impact wh- theory when you, a billion dollars yeah, with, <laughs> when we, as we always say lisa in this house i go i'll say to maria with a b <laughs> we'll meet certain people and i'll say with a b billion. with an m with a, with a lot of m's <laughs> i'll go maria with a b and she goes, he knows a thing or two, guys, is what he's trying yeah, to do. Yeah, like this is no, no, just, no. Very, but just very to be precious. clear, I may know a thing or two, but I also still fail every single day. Um, but I still show up with a big smile, and I think that's super important as well. Yeah, but oh. that and that and but and this this is very valuable and and information, and you are very Ooh, valuable. Italian person. goodbye. Let me get to the episode, and everybody will see this. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Follow us at Better Together with Maria, at Stephen Lemieux Photo, at, Kels- at Kelsmeyer2, at Anne Lamott, at Lisa Bilyeu. And remember, be nice people, make good choices, and be present.